Well, thank you, Richard, very much. And thank you, Danny, and everyone for hosting this. Thank you uh, just for the opportunity to be with you today and to share with you. So grateful for Joe and for Frank and for Richard and uh, for Bob and for um, Rick and for um, Jimbo and their willingness to share with you. We love pastors deeply, and uh, we love the church deeply. And the reality is the church in North America is in a very, very difficult and dangerous place. We are in, in many ways, across the broad spectrum, it hasn't been this bad since the Civil War. In the year 2000, as this new century dawned, the median evangelical church in North America had 137 people in gathered worship. That means half the churches had more and half the churches had less. Today, that number, just 23 years later, is 67, nearly half. Now, if you follow me on social media or Facebook or anything else, you know I, am, I do not count God's work by how many people show up on Sunday morning. I've never pastored a church of more than 150. I'm not bragging, it's just the truth. And uh, every Sunday I preach to between 40 and 60 people. But I am saying that churches at one time that really impacted their neighborhoods, impacted their communities, made disciples, are now struggling to hang on. And in a denomination that has more seminaries and more missionaries and more pastors and more money than any other denomination in North America and a denomination that believes in the Bible from Genesis to the map in the back, We baptized less than 200,000 people last year, and we closed nearly 800 churches a year. And unless you think we're closing churches where people don't live, <coughs> get choked up when I think about this. 75% of the churches that we closed were in communities larger than 100,000. 90% of churches that closed were in communities that had grown in population in the previous decade. We're closing churches where we need churches. And here's the reality. I'm not in this work because I, I have a concern for the future of the Southern Baptist denomination. They come and they go. I mean, I love it. I've been a Southern Baptist all my life. Everybody says that, but it's true. I was born on a Wednesday night. My dad did prayer meeting that night. He left the hospital and went to prayer meeting. So, uh, and my great-grandfather was a Southern Baptist pastor, um, and I've been it all my life. But... I'm not in this work because I want to see the Southern Baptist Convention continue. I'm in this work because the dying church robs God of His glory. Who will rob God? You preach that all the time when you talk about tithing. We know that God deserves it. Well, God deserves glory from His church. And when a church declines and dies, it robs God of the glory due Him. And that's a big deal. When a church sets on a corner for 150 years and says, we believe the Bible. We believe in the fidelity of Scripture. We believe in the inspired and errant Word of God. We believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He died a substitutionary death. He rose on the third day. He sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. We believe in the blood of the cross. We believe that He's coming back in power. We believe He can do all things. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. But He couldn't keep this church open. And the world looks at that and says, well, they're no different than Kmart and Sears and everything else that comes and goes. I got news for you. You're different than Kmart and Sears and everything else that comes and goes. Just because the community changes doesn't mean you should lose your church. If there are still people to be reached and a gospel to be shared, why should that church close its doors? One of the reasons I love Richard so much, our hearts just resonate. We were at a meeting early on when I first got this role at North American Mission Board, and the question people always ask me is, well, shouldn't some churches just close almost eagerly? <laughs> shouldn't we just shut some of them down? And the reality of it is, Paul never suggested we close the church at Corinth, even though it was a dumpster fire. Even when he wrote 2 Corinthians, he never suggested closing it down. And I guarantee you, there's stuff going on in that church that's not going on in your church. I hope. <laughs> and sometimes we just so easy, we just want to move them on out. And, just, and look, for the first half of my ministry, first two-thirds of my ministry, all I did was church planting, and I avoided dying churches. I didn't want to be near them. I felt they were contagious. Go across the street and plant something brand new and let those things die. We used to say at the old home mission board, plow around it. 
You got a stump in there? Plow around it, man. Don't waste time trying to blow it out. Just plow around it. And that's how we looked at dying churches. The church growth movement says you put resources where there's receptivity. If there's no receptivity, you don't put any resources there. And that guided us for 75 years. So we only put resources where we saw receptivity. Only thing is, that's not how the New Testament tells us to do it. And that is the bride of Christ. And when that church closes its doors, it robs God of His glory. It says something about our God to a lost world that we don't want said. So dying churches are a really, really important thing. So I'm in this work, and I trust you're in this work because we desire to see God's glory. So then it becomes not an act of strategic denominational missions. It's an act of worship because it's about God's glory. And in worship, that's what I was created to do. I was created to worship. I'm going to worship all of eternity. I was, you and I were created to worship. So when you replant a dying church, you're worshiping. And if you can help your congregants understand, this is not about strategizing to replant a dying church. This is about how do we best worship God? Do that for which we've been created. And how in the world do we get our people to care more about the future than they care about the past? And in most dying churches, they are more protective and caring about the past than they are about the future. And they would rather hold on to a broken past than embrace an uncertain future. A lot of reasons for that. We're going to go through some of them. Now, hang with me, because this is really discouraging. All this is why churches die. And if the Lord doesn't return overnight, if He does, we don't need to come back anyway. Those of you who come back, you probably need it. But if He returns overnight, <laughs> if He rather, if He doesn't return, I, used, I asked Tom Rayner one time, you know, we do those podcasts weeks and months ahead. I said, if the Lord comes back, does this podcast still come on? He said, I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> Sorry. I'm ADD, totally. Tomorrow, if the Lord doesn't return, and I am, he, by His grace, I'm able to come back here, tomorrow we will unpack some of the solutions and what we see God doing. But today, we're going to look at some of the symptoms of a dying church. When that church was planted, somebody raised the banner of God's glory in that place, and striking those colors is tragic. I mentioned a moment ago, Richard and I, our hearts resonated. We were at the North American Mission Board after I first got this job. People were saying, shouldn't some just churches just die? And Richard spoke up and he said, I've never seen a church with, a, with an expiration date on its foundation or on its cornerstone. Milk has expiration dates. My little grandsons, where we were out in the yard one time and these little bunnies come out of a hole and they get all excited and they're little wild rabbits and they run away. And my wife says, maybe we should get a rabbit for the grandchildren. Sound like a good idea at the time. So we get this cute little bunny and he's so cute, but he grows up, right? And he's messy and he's smelly and, and, and he's a problem. And, and, and so I get online and I look, I Google life expectancy of a rabbit. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's like seven to nine years. I actually went on a vacation. We had to board the rabbit. So I took the rabbit to our vet to board the rabbit. His name was Monroe. Took him there to board the rabbit. And as I'm signing him in, the lady says, if we can't reach you, how much do we permission do we have to spend to save the rabbit's life? I said, $12.50. She said, oh my. I said, well, that's what he cost. I can replace him. I got news for you. If your rabbit gets sick, just let it die and go get another one. That's all I'm going to say. Anyway, there's no life expectancy on a church. It goes as long as Christ wants it to go. Now, if the neighborhood goes away, if, if, if it's all industry and factories, yes. If the, we, I'm from Kansas and Nebraska. I still live in Kansas, right? You all know what it's like to live out here. I said at lunch we get, we get uh, altitude sickness on a railroad overpass. I mean, it's all flat. And, and we have towns in Kansas, Nebraska that existed 75 years ago that don't exist anymore. Well, you don't need a church where there's no town. You don't need a church necessarily where there's no community around it. But we close, those are the rare exceptions. Of the 800 churches that close every year, Southern Baptist in North America, the vast majority of them, there are still lost people literally within walking distance of that church. People addicted to drugs 
and, and within walking distance of that church. People dying with cancer. People who's involved in, in, in all kinds of irresponsible behavior. Families that are torn apart. Children that are abused. All within walking distance of a church that says, well, we just got to close our doors. It is a tremendous tragedy. And so when a denomination like ours closes 800 churches a year, when the median size of an evangelical church in 20 years goes from 137 to 67, we are in some deep trouble. And I hope it's just the Lord getting our attention and shaking us and ready to do something amazing with us. And I hope it's not He's just passed over us and now the whole center of gravity for the church is going to move to some other continent. And we're going to raise our grandchildren in a place like Europe. Well, on that happy note, here are some, here are some of the reasons. Here are some of the reasons that churches die. We looked at dying churches across North America. As Tom was doing his, his uh, autopsy of a deceased church, and I highly recommend that book, and his second book that came out, uh, between Tom and I, we've written 41 books. He's written 40, I've written one. So I say that on the podcast all the time. Between he and I, we've written 41 books. But between he and I, we sold over a million books. So that's pretty exciting. He sold a million three, and I sold about 40 copies. Uh, but nonetheless, Tom, when, when, in talking to, to Tom about this, as he was doing autopsy of a deceased church and then anatomy of a revived church, we were doing some of the same thing in back engineering churches that died. We looked at churches that died, and we looked at their 10- and 20-year history of um, uh, their ACP numbers, and we talked, interviewed their members. And this is what, these are the things that, if you see these in your church, these are not signs of health. And if you ignore them, they'll lead you where you don't want to go. First of all, and there are many of these, they rely on programs and they rely on personalities rather than relying on the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's our fault because we have taught them to rely on programs and personalities rather than to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. When a church is dying and inclining and they contact myself or a state convention person or an associational leader or someone from our team, they, they want to know what can we do. And what they're not thinking is, they're not thinking, how can we repent? How can we uh, 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 be, be turned from our own agenda? And how can we seek Jesus like we've never sought him before because we know he has a plan for this church? I've never had anyone say that to me. What they say is, can you help us find the right pastor? Or is there some program we can have that will help turn this thing around? Well, as Richard said, you have a pastor. His name is Jesus Christ. He's the chief shepherd. If you're not going to listen to that pastor, you're not going to listen to the ornate under shepherd. And oftentimes, they want a young pastor. We'll talk, well, the, another reason churches die is they refuse, refuse, refuse to give leadership to the next generation. I don't mean they don't want young people there. They would love to have young people there. They just don't want young people doing anything that really matters. They don't want young people changing anything. They don't want the building to look like the young people want it to look. They don't want the worship service to look like the young people want it to look. They don't want the, the organization and the governance to look like the young people would want it to look. They don't want the schedule weekly to look like the young people would. But we want young people here. Well, it isn't going to happen. I could put you in a car, and I could take you anywhere, many places in a county, and I could show you churches filled with young people. Young people will go to church. They just won't go to your church. And the answer is not a young pastor. People come to me and say, well, we just need a young pastor. And I say, well, how young? Eight, nine years old? What do you want to go for here? <laughs> I mean, if we're going to go young, let's go young. So if you get a young pastor in his 30s, he's got three kids, you bring him in, and, and I say, well, what would he, well, he'll attract young people. Well, why don't we begin by asking this question, what is it that makes this place unattractive to young people? Why did they leave in the first place? A number of years ago, I went to Kansas City and was meeting with a church that had gone from about 400 to 200 in a decade, and it was an old First Baptist church, nothing wrong with being an old First Baptist church, I love them, but it was an old First Baptist church, it had been there forever. And I was meeting in the basement with the deacons about 12 or 14 of them, and um, they were just really concerned that they were losing all their young people. And one of the deacons said, we're using, losing our young people to all these church plants. I said, really? So like Sunday morning, this, these black vans show up, and when young people get out of their cars, they get thrown into the black van and driven off to a church plant? And they didn't laugh at that either. <laughs> no, you know what I mean, yada, yada, yada. And I said, well, at that time, I was probably in my late mid-50s. I said, that's my age. 
Anybody here younger than that? And not a single one of them was younger than that. And I said, well, that's your problem. You don't have any young deacons. Because in that church, the deacons ran everything. You don't have any young deacons. To which the chairman piped up and said, well, that's because there aren't any young people here qualified to be deacons. Let me read between the lines. That means there weren't any young men coming on Wednesday nights every Wednesday night. That's what that probably meant. Just thought I'd throw that out there. In other words, they weren't qualified. And I said, well, the issue isn't that. The issue is it's your job to get them qualified to be deacons. It's not your job to sit back and see if they can be qualified. It's your job to actively disciple them to become deacons by giving them responsibility and helping them have ownership in this church before they reach the age of 55. But the reality of it is, well, I'll, I'll move on. So they value, pref- they value their people. You, you don't follow this. It's not going to work, so just turn it off. <laughs> it's pretty good. You're, you're kind of doing it pretty good there, but just let it go. Because I, I don't know where I'm going, but we'll get there when we get there. Because there's no way I could do this whole thing in 30 minutes. But anyway, so I, I, I'm combining some of them. I'm being very strategic about this, all right? So... They, they, they choose programs over, and people over the power of the Holy Spirit. They refuse to give leadership to the next generation. So much so that they would rather keep things the way they are and die than see them change and let young people take the lead. The problem with that is there's no joy in keeping things the way they are. Why is it? that those of us my age find it so difficult to embrace change in the church. Well, first of all, we just find it difficult to embrace change, period. It's the way we are as old people. The writer of Ecclesiastes says, to remember the Lord in the days of your youth before the evil days come, and then he describes the evil days. You wake at the sound of a bird. That means you can't sleep anymore because you don't have melatonin, and you go to bed and you get up early before dawn. So men my age, after we retire, we go down to McDonald's and have coffee and and biscuits at six in the morning even though we got nothing to do all day because we're up you get some teenager he'd sleep for three years if you didn't wake him up (laughs) but when you're old you wake at the sound of a bird when you're old the windows grow dim you can't see anymore the grinders cease you can't eat like you used to the strong men tremble your legs are weak he says you are fear of heights i mean you get to be my age i'm going to be careful going down these stairs I mean, 30 years ago, I just hopped down them, but I'm looking at them now going, there ain't no rail here, and they're at a weird angle, and they're all the same color. I thought about all of that, all right? Because it has happened before. You, you, so when you get old, and, and the writer says that, that those are evil days, and, and it is a hard thing growing old. I know when you're young and you look at old people, you think you got your house paid, you get discount coffee, you discount rates on your internet because you're old. But when you get to be our age, you have two things on your refrigerator. You have pictures of grandkids you don't see anymore and doctor's appointments. So, like, I love my wife so much, and I leave on a trip. I just came back from one trip, getting ready to go to another one, and, you know, she hugs me and loves me. Oh, I'm so glad you're out. Be sure and take your medicine with you. Have you got all your right pills? You know, it's hard to seem like a real hunky guy when your wife asks you to take in all your pills with you. Like, I must be her dreamboat, right? Just to put the little pills in there, make sure he takes them. I don't like getting old. I don't like, you know, like Richard said, there was a time when when people looked at Richard and I and said, man, I can't believe you're doing so much at such a young age. We haven't heard that in a long time. And I don't like change. I have to rent cars everywhere I go. Can't they just make a car that is intuitive when you turn the thing on? I don't know where the lights are. I don't know where the key is. I don't like those keyless remotes. I never like... I don't know where the key ever is. If, it, if you have a key in the remote, if, you have a, it just, if, if it's in the ignition, it stays in the ignition, for goodness sake. I'm always losing the remote key. I don't know where it is. It's somewhere in the car. It fell under the seat. Or, or, I, or my wife, I, I drop her off at the grocery store. She's got the key in her purse, right? So she goes into the store, and it starts beeping. And I'm thinking, why do we have to change anything? It was fine. It used to be you just turn on the lights, you pull it out, right? That was your lights on. And, and, and your brights were on the floor by the brake, and you tapped it. That was it. Right? And I mean, I don't know. I can't get it. It's just, it's frustrating. (laughs) And I don't know how to watch TV anymore. I want to watch K State play basketball. I got to put it, it's on ESPN Plus. Well, what's ESPN Plus? I got ESPN, but you don't have ESPN Plus. Plus what? Plus ESPN. How do I get that? You pay $9.99 more a month. 
All right, I'll pay $9.99 more a month. Now I want to watch K-State play football. Well, it's got to watch Hulu. Well, what's Hulu? Well, it's over here. My wife was looking at our thing the other day. She said, you have Hulu, you have YouTube, you have FUBU TV. Why do you have all these? I said, I don't know. I just keep clicking because I want to watch my shows. I don't even know how it works. There's no antenna. There's no cord to anything. It's weird. We don't have a landline. I realize I have four grandsons. They have never had the privilege of listening to a busy tone on a phone. You ever think about that? Never heard that. I don't even recognize my culture anymore. I don't recognize my Congress anymore. I don't recognize the media anymore. But as an old person, there's one place I go every week where everything's the same. I can park in the same parking spot. I can walk in the same door. I can take a big, deep breath and smell that wonderful smell of church building. I could blindfold most of you and take you to five buildings in this city, and I could walk you into church building, and you go, that's a church basement. I know that smell anywhere. It's not a bad smell. It's not a good smell. It's just a familiar smell. Yankee Candle could have church basement, and we would know exactly what it was. Oh, that's church basement. I remember that. That's what that smells. Oh, here's one. It's potluck dinner. I smell that. Yeah, I got that. That's good. Oh, here's the old nursery. I smell that one too. You can just smell it in the building, you know. And then you can look at the same pictures on the same wall and the same silk plants everywhere. And, and it's all the same. And there's just something very calm and very calming about that sameness. You know, well, my dad, even years ago, we had a painted baptistry scene at the church where my dad pastored, and it always bothered him because it was kind of busy. So he closed the curtains on the baptistry scene. Oh, my goodness. I mean, they about fired him over that. You can't close those curtains. Well, why not? Well, so-and-so painted that years ago, and it's the Jordan River. Trust me, it didn't look like the Jordan River. <laughs> but it was cool. After a few years there, I did notice there was a squirrel in one of the trees like where's Waldo <laughs> so you could tell your friends I found a squirrel have you found it I don't see a squirrel there's a squirrel there he's up there so the familiarity of all those things what listen I know I'm joking but here's what happens in a world of constant change in a world where as we grow older we know we're going to have less and less freedom we're going to have less and less good health we're going to have less and less important contacts with others that we love and so this church, and we have less and less power and authority in our lives. We no longer have a job to go to. Maybe our career doesn't even exist anymore. Kids don't really, you know, my kids do this now. They talk like you're not even in the room. You know, dad says such, I'm sorry, I'm right here. Oh yeah, dad, sorry about that. They look right past you. But no matter how small that church might be, as an older member, you can walk in there and you can be ahead of the finance committee. And ain't nothing going to happen unless you approve it. You can be head of the church council, and nothing's going to go on unless you approve it. And there's something really comforting about having one place where your voice matters again, and one place where you know how everything is going to function, and one place where there are no surprises, and one place where there are no changes. But here's the problem with that. The adversary has done a diabolical transition in our lives. Satan, he, he is absolutely consumed with robbing God of His glory. That's why He rebelled in heaven, remember? That's why He came to Adam and Eve to, 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 for the fall of creation. He, he, in a sense, Satan doesn't care a thing about you or me. He just wants to rob God of His glory by destroying us. And so he wants to rob God of his glory by seeing that church die. And one of the ways he can do it, as Baptist, he's not going to get you to not believe the Bible. He's not going to get you to not believe in solid doctrine. But he can get you to love the church as you know it and experience it more than you love Jesus. And he can have that church as you know it and experience become an idol. And among other things, an idol is something you run to for comfort, for meaning, and for security. But you know something is a false idol when you're afraid of losing it, because you'll never lose Jesus. But if you're afraid of somebody taking away those pews, or somebody taking away the, 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 the decorations that you've had in the past, or someone moving the sanctuary around, or 
someone changing something. You've made that an idol. Dying churches tend to value their preferences over the needs of the unreached. They'll tell you they don't, but look, I grew up in church. I love the church. That's why I'm in this work. Almost every dying church I know of has a kitchen and a fellowship hall. And there are very few dying churches I know of who tell the community, if you want to come in and have a family banquet, you want to have a family reunion, you want to have your grandparents' 60th anniversary, you live in our neighborhood, you can use our building for free. Oh, wait, you can't let those people come in and use our building. What if they did something to it? Or what if they... Well, you're not going to get a crown in heaven for keeping a pristine building. Proverbs says, where the stall is clean, there's not much oxen, but much work is done by an ox. Look, we've done this, and the reason I'm saying this is because it's what we've done in the churches I've been in. We we let the community know, look, you got to sign up. One of our members has to be there to host it. You can't smoke, you can't drink, you can't dance, although I think they do dance sometimes. But you can't smoke, you can't drink, you can't dance, you can't do drugs. But wouldn't you want to have a bunch of people in your neighborhood come and fellowship in your fellowship hall and have your members there to host them? What's wrong with that? Or as one of my interns that went to Wisconsin and he got up there and the church was about to die, but around them were some poor poor neighborhoods and a lot of single parent homes and they didn't have washers and dryers and they were going to the the cap to the washeteria, taking their two-year-old and four-year-old, putting them in the car, trying to do laundry on the weekends and no, take some of those empty rooms they weren't using in church. It used to be Sunday school rooms because they didn't have any Sunday school. They had no children at all. And, and put washers and dryers in those rooms and then let the community know Saturday mornings, Thursday nights, you can come in here and you can do your laundry and we'll watch your kids and teach them about Jesus. Well, now you got kids in the nursery. Now you got people, and, and the older ladies could work in the laundry and help fold the clothes and talk to the younger mothers and that's what I'm talking about. You value the, your preferences over the needs of the unreached. You say, well, we can't do that. We would lose some people. Well, that's the next one. When a church begins to make decisions based on not losing people, that's the death wheeze of a church. Because then you've given up leadership to whoever says, I'm going to leave if you do this. And I agree with what Richard said. If God called them, the only reason they should leave is if God tells them to leave. Not if they don't like what you're doing to the building or the organization you put in or some of the stuff that's happening. They anesthetize the pain of death with an overabundance of activity and maintaining with great passion outdated governance and programs. In other words, dying churches just keep doing what they've been doing. It's just not getting any results. But as long as they keep doing what they're doing, they think they're not going to die because we're still doing what we're doing. And all the activity just anesthetizes that pain of death. I was in a, a church transitional pastor not long ago. Church had been 400, was now down to 40, and they wanted to have Sunday nights and Wednesday nights because they'd always had Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. Meanwhile, they hadn't baptized anybody in five years. The church was declining in numbers, but we got to keep having Saturday, Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. Well, what are you doing on Sunday nights and Wednesday night to impact the community? It impacted, what are you doing? Well, they weren't doing anything. They were just gathering again on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. So I was there one Sunday night. I went every Sunday night. And there was a, maybe a dozen to 15 on Sunday nights, all of them elderly like me. And so one night in October, one of the elderly ladies stands up. She says, I would like to make a suggestion. None of us need to be out driving late at night. I felt like I said, well, amen to that. She said, so it's getting dark earlier. Why don't we just wait till spring? And, have, and immediately one of the two remaining deacons stood up and looked there. And he said, well, you can stay home if you want to, but the rest of us are coming out on Sunday nights. Well, that's a real reason to come together. Guilt, habit, we're not giving up. And even sometimes to say, well, you know, those new churches, they don't meet on Sunday nights, but we still do. Well, if God wants you to meet on Sunday night, meet on Sunday night. But if you're going through all the motions and you have all the activity and there's no disciples being made and there's no one being reached for Christ and no impact in your neighborhood, don't pat yourself on the back too much that you're still going through all the motions. You're anesthetizing the pain of death with an overabundance of activity that's not making any difference in the community or in the lives of people. What was once a community church becomes a commuter church. And there's no better question to ask yourself than this. If your church closed its doors tomorrow, if only the members of that church were affected, you've probably, no, you have failed 
as the church of Jesus Christ in that community. Those who've been dealt most generously with should be the most generous people in the community. No one's been dealt more generously with than those who've been redeemed by the blood of Christ. Therefore, that we are Christians in this neighborhood, we should be the most generous people in the neighborhood, the most generous people in our workplace, the most generous people in our extended family. That means we're generous with our time, we're generous with our budget, we're generous with our building. So much so that even people who don't believe in Jesus say, that church brings value to our community because those people love us and care for us. But far too often, we believe the church is there, excuse me, far too often, we believe the community is there to serve the church. What do I mean by that? Well, if your church is declining, what do you often think? How do we get people in here? How do we grow the church off of the neighborhood? I know what we mean when we say prospects. I grew up with prospect list. My dad is a little Buick Skylark, had a little, one of those little, before you had coffee cup holders, he had one of those little plastic things you put on the transmission case there. And he had, we put his coffee and little slips. And we all, I never remember a time in my dad's car he didn't have a bunch of pink slips that were prospect lists. And he made visits every day to prospects. That's fine. I get what we mean. But I like what Tom Rainer said one time. Even the language prospect, that's a prospect. Who do we know a prospect is? Is the woman at the well a prospect? No. Zacchaeus been a prospect, the most hated man in town? No. You don't know who a prospect is. Share the gospel with everybody. And the prospects are not there. Look, I used to be in sales for a short time and a long time ago. And a prospect was somebody that would put money in my pocket. Somebody that would do something. for I could, I could build my business off a of prospect. Look, the, the community is not there to grow your church. Now, I know one of the first churches I ever built, we put a sign out front and said, come grow with us. Dr. Ranger said he did the same thing in Florida. Come grow with us. Why would a lost person want to come grow with you? Why would they be remotely interested? What that basically says to them is come buy your car here. Come eat at our restaurant. Come visit our church. Brothers and sisters, the community is not there for the church. The church is there for the community. You are to serve them and love them. Oftentimes when I go to a declining church, I'll talk about that in the community. Well, we've tried to have block parties. We've tried to have... Uh, give away food. We give away food every week. We give away clothes. We have block parties. They come and they jump on the moonwalk and they get their face painted and they eat the snow cones. They pick up the diapers. They take the clothes. They take the groceries. And then they never come on Sunday. Well, because you don't have a moonwalk on Sunday. You're not painting paces, painting, pace, painting, painting faces on Sunday. You're not giving away diapers on Sunday. They're coming because they want those things. You don't do those things to get people in your neighborhood into the church. You do those things to get the people in your church into the lives of the people in the neighborhood. You do those things because that's what Jesus would do. You do those things because you're to be love them and embrace them and care for them, whether they come to your worship service or not. And your church needs to be so important. Your church needs to have a ministry footprint in that neighborhood that is noticeable and real, realized. That that, church, that neighborhood is noticeably better because your church is there. And dying churches cease to become part of the fabric of the community. What was a community church now becomes a commuter church. Wow. They resent the community for not responding as it once did. They say things like, this community is very resistant to us. They don't respond to us. They don't come to the things we offer. It's a little bit like inviting a girl to the dance, and she always, well, we don't dance. Inviting a girl to the <laughs> skating rink at youth night. That was the only way I could dance as a youth, being a Baptist preacher's kid, was skating. We all went skating because it was our kind of, you know, they turned the lights on and play music, and you might, you might be able to hold a hand on a couple of skate. You never know. If you, got, if you got fortunate. Anyway, I digress. But it's like inviting a girl out and she keeps turning you down and finally you just get mad at her for turning you down. There are many churches that resent the community because it doesn't respond as it used to because the community isn't like it used to be. There was a time when that community and that church were homogeneous. They were alike. But that never stays the same. Church communities are always changing. Even in rural small towns, communities are changing. Demographics are changing. 
And if we don't stay up with that, we don't try to embrace every new group that comes in there because they're not brought in there by econ economic problems or by immigration issues or by social... They're brought in there because the sovereign God brings them to your neighborhood because He wants you to reach them. They are your mission field. And resenting the community because it's not responsive to you or wishing the community were different than it is, that is the death wheeze of a church. Because Jesus doesn't resent them. He loves them. Dying churches value the process of decision over the outcome of decision. What do I mean by that? I mean, you got people in your church that care more about the bylaws than they care about the New Testament. And you might be able to preach something that's weird in the New Testament, and they'd let it pass because they wouldn't know it anyway. But you try to do something against the bylaws, and buddy, you're gone the next day. Because the bylaws matter. It's like this thing of, of, of church governance. We, we've created, a, in many churches, we've created a church governance that says this, the most carnal, unprayed up person in your church can derail anything. Then we say, well, how, why isn't God here? Why doesn't he work? Because you've created a system that lets maybe even unregenerate people stop the work of God. I'm just calling it like I see it, guys. I grew up in church. The one time my mother never wanted to go to church was one Wednesday night a month. You want to guess what Wednesday night that was? And I'm joking about it, man. She dreaded it. Nothing really bad ever happened, but she sat there and knew anything could happen on a Wednesday night business meeting. And it can. And you can have a group that you say, we want you to come together. Well, we did. We had a group that came together. I remember this very distinctly. My mother was the preschool director of our church. They had... You may think you ought to have speakers in your nursery. That's whatever. But anyway, they had speakers in the nursery. And my mother was like, you don't need to be listening to the sermon while you've got three-year-olds in here. You need to pay attention to three-year-olds, right? You don't need speakers in the nursery. Love the kids. Focus them. They're developing their opinion about church by how you love them and care for them at two and three years of age. So they put together a committee, which all Baptist churches back then did, and they studied the speakers in the nursery. Again, that's enough to drive young people crazy, right? So, I'm telling you. So, anyway, they finally agreed after a couple of months of looking at it that, yes, we'll take the speakers out of the nursery. So, they take it where? To the church council. The church council says, take the speakers out of the nursery. Take it to the deacons. Deacons say, take the speakers out of the nursery. Well, now it's been about four months. We finally take it to business meeting. Let, why business meeting we had to do this? I have no idea. Most of the people in business meeting never go to the nursery. What difference does it make? The committee... To study it, the church council, the deacons all agreed we should take it out of the nursery. One man stands up. He says, I think they ought to be able to hear the sermon while we're back there. Another guy says, I do too. I second that motion. And you could just see, it's like, well, the committee may be right, but these guys are going to cause such a fuss about it, and I know who they are, and I don't want to deal with that. So the church tabled it, and to this day, 50 years later, there are speakers in the nursery. And then we wonder, we value the process of decision. It's important that everybody be heard on everything. No, it isn't. Show me that in the New Testament. Why would the New Testament spend so much time selecting, giving the qualification of leaders if it didn't expect those leaders to actually lead? And you can ask lay people to lead, and they'll be grateful to lead, and we want them to lead. But then when other people question their leadership and and months of work they've done comes undone because one person stands up and says i don't think we should and that person just likes to be negative all the time anyway that has to be dealt with in rayner's book anatomy of revived church he gives and I'll, i'm getting ahead of myself this is what we'll talk about next week next tomorrow night but one of the things you have to do in revived church is you have to deal with toxins in the church and dying churches choose not to deal with toxins they choose to let toxins continue. And when they do that, oftentimes what that happens is they value the process of decision over the outcome of decision. And decisions that should have been made are not made. And decisions that shouldn't have been made are made. And it really doesn't matter who your pastor is at that time or who your deacons are at that time. If that's the governance, it's a really challenging thing. And Satan uses that. I think it was your brother Mel who one time said at First Baptist Jonesboro, the last thing this church needs is your unprayed over opinion. And Richard Henry used to always say, we get the wrong answer because we ask the wrong question. 
And dear church member, you never ask a church, should we do something or not? Do you think we should take the speakers out of the nursery? Do you think we should redecorate the sanctuary? Do you think we should go into a building program? Do you think we should adjust our schedules? You never ask that. Because it doesn't matter what you or I think. It doesn't matter what you and I have done for this church for the last 40 years in terms of our salvation. It does matter in terms of edification, but not in terms of our salvation. It doesn't matter at all. You could, you could give every dollar. You could serve this church for 40 years. You could put the roof on all by yourself. You could give every dollar you have to the IMB. You could sell your house and give it all the state missions. You could move into the church and live in the church. You could move into the flower room. There's probably room for you in there. Every church that has a flower room is not dying, but every dying church has a flower room. <laughs> and it's locked, and you don't have a key. But you can move into the flower room, and you could live there and serve the church 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it wouldn't buy you one minute out of hell. The only reason you and I have been redeemed and have a home in heaven and not eternity in hell is the finished work of Jesus Christ. And this is His church. You may have worked here all your life, but you didn't buy it with your blood. It belongs to Him. And until we come to that place where we realize this church belongs to Him and not to us, and we get aligned with His agenda, because Jesus has a plan for every church. He is not in heaven looking at your church going, I don't know what to do about that. He has a plan for your church. And our goal is to help us come to the place where we hear Him and we see Him and we follow His plan. Those are just some of the characteristics of a dying church. And I would challenge you, if you see any of those in your church, find ways to address them immediately. We're going to sing and then we're going to go eat. And I know we went a little long, but it's my conference. I can do whatever I want. No. <laughs> you put me last, that's what you're going to get, right? Someone said, are you standing till the bitter end? I said, bro, I am the bitter end. All right. Come back next tomorrow. We'll talk about the more positive things. But I want us to turn our heart back to worship. I want us to start with worship today, end with worship tonight. And I'm so grateful for Joe and the way he leads us, really helps, leads us to God's throne.